Unveiling the Mysteries of the Process Church With the publication of Timothy Willey's book on the process, a new perspective of the group has emerged which reveals a radically different view from all that has been written about to this point, the majority of the books and articles having enmeshed the process into a conspiratorial role by identifying it with the Manson family, son of Sam or by postulating other nefarious activities that they imagine they might have been involved in. This documentary aims to reveal and dispel the mysteries of the process and is presented from a non-conspiratorial perspective. The process developed into an extremely intelligent, creative and innovative system of psychotherapy which produced shocking results in its effectiveness and beneficially changed the lives of those involved in its methods. While the sociological impact evidenced by the process upon any widespread mainstream audience was minor, those who utilized their therapeutic methods found them an effective way to tap inner reservoirs and many aspirants were enthralled by the apocalyptic philosophy espoused by Robert de Grimston. Many of de Grimston's writings are heavily steeped in rhetoric and combine the approach of philosophic logicians with the bombastic apocalyptic style of Austin Osmond Spare. The process represented many different things to each of its adherents. It served a myriad of simultaneous functions to those that it attracted and was a unique organization that was much more multifaceted than merely being an offshoot of Scientology. The process was a sociological experiment that pushed the boundaries of what was achievable working within a group dynamic. It continually evolved and changed from its early period in 1966 to the schism in 1974 at which time it ceased to be known as the process. They initially emerged as a psychotherapeutic group but eventually evolved more religious overtones to their decrees. After their journey to Stil, the direction of the group had dramatically changed. The process articulated and promoted a doomsday message concerning an approaching Armageddon. The extremeness of their message being espoused regarding the unity of Christ and Satan, although it was concerned with the reconciliation of opposites, may have been seen as extreme for those who first encountered them. The process believed that the world was coming to an end, but that it would be saved if they could assist both Christ and Satan in their reconciliation. Robert and Mary Ann met while both were deeply involved in the exploration of the methods of Scientology. After becoming clear, Mary Ann influenced Robert, during their sessions as auditors using the e-meter, to deviate from the standard practice of auditing by following their own line of questioning designed to uncover points of contention which were spiritual and psychological block in those participants. Marianne found a complementary partner in Robert, and aided by a powerful chemistry that developed, they were able to evolve techniques which came to be used in compulsions analysis. Robert changed his last name to de Grimston because of its occult significance. They continuously revised and improved upon their therapeutic techniques and probed the minds of their inner circle in lengthy brain probing sessions and produced oftentimes startling results. In 1962 Robert Moore and Marianne McLean joined the Scientology Centre located in London on Fitzroy Street. After quickly rising through and acquiring considerable skills as Scientology auditors, they grew weary with the unquestioning adherence to Hubbard's doctrine and began to develop their own methods for auditing. They resigned their positions in the Scientology organization and began to combine the concepts of Adler regarding compulsive goals with techniques taken from Scientology. Continually refining their methods and producing dramatic results with their clients, in 1963 they announced their own psychotherapeutic group, known as Compulsions Analysis. Its methods were designed to rid the patient of compulsive behaviors. 
they used the e-meter as a powerful tool to measure emotional charge and produced effective results through their adept usage of the device. As the therapy sessions continued, a deeper sense of spiritual purpose began to emerge from the group of participants, under the guidance of Robert and Marianne, and this manifested in the formation of the Process Church. The name Process was chosen as a reference to the change that occurred through transformative means of their influence. They relocated to Two Balfour Place in the Mayfair District in London and emanated a professional demeanor in this upscale neighborhood. After lengthy deliberation, it was ascertained that the group should travel to Zstil in the Yucatan Peninsula. While living at Zstil, the group weathered a severe hurricane, and de Grimston experienced a direct contact with the gods. The members experienced a rebirth and realized a fundamental theology level of purpose and significance, and the group set course on a spiritual odyssey. The Omega drifted further from reach after this early period and soon was only seen by those in the innermost circle. As the processor's theological ideologies developed, de Grimston interpreted three basic forces which he designated as God, Lucifer, and Satan. Christ was presented as the unification principle of these divergent energies. Because Satan was included amongst these primordial energies, it was easily and purposely misconstrued by those who had accused the process of being involved in Satan worship, animal sacrifice and venerating the principles of evil. The gods and their people clearly delineates the four paths held within the process and how each may be described. It provides a thorough account of the role of the gods and how they manifest in our lives and may be better understood and used to one's advantage. This eventually evolved into a system of higher and lower aspects of each of the four divisions. The four gods of the process represent basic underlying personality types which at their core can be observed to have four distinct and unique attributes. Although some process members treated them as actually existing in a non-corporeal sense, Others conceived them as theoretical archetypes, a combination of which makes up the human psyche. By properly understanding the subconscious drives and desires that are motivated through the interactions of the gods, man may come to realize the structures that control our behavior and attain to the aspirations of one's higher self. Each individual leans more to one particular god, although all four are present in the self to varying degrees. Jehovah represents strength. He is the wrathful God of vengeance and retribution, demands discipline, courage, ruthlessness and a single-minded dedication to duty, purity, and self-denial. Lucifer, the light-bearer, urges us to enjoy life to the fullest, to value success in human terms, to be gentle, kind and loving, and to live in peace and harmony with one another. This defines the ethos which characterized the 60s into the 70s generation. Lucifer has always held a special occult significance within magic and secret societies. Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society, Nazi occultism, and Freemasonry, all have recognized the primary importance of the mythological role of Lucifer. He is exemplified by an awareness of the physical aesthetics of beauty and body image, hedonistic indulgence, free will, and material success. In Lucifer Rising, Kenneth Anger embodies this image and spirit of Lucifer as a representation of the energies which had been emerging. Satan represented separation, and was perceived as an adversary. He is the receiver of transcended souls and corrupted bodies. He instills in us two directly opposite qualities. At one end, an urge to rise above all human and physical needs and appetites to be all soul and nobody. At the other end, to sink beneath all human codes of behavior and to wallow in a morass of violence, lunacy and excessive physical indulgence. Christ is the unifier and is the emissary of the gods. He plays a pivotal role in the salvation of humanity through his task of unifying the universe. He is the reconciler of opposites and the transcender of conflict. Many rituals were devised to bring process members into communion with each of these gods. It played a major importance for processions to realize that they were subject to the will of the gods. 
several books play an especially important role in conveying the message of the process. Exit, is a book of teachings of the process, which were originally intended only to be read by internal breathing. It consisted of a series of letters called Be Our Brethren Information. It includes BI 7 The Universal Law, BI 5 The Cycle of Ignorance, BI 13 The Separation, BI 14 The Self, BI 16 Control is Contact, BI 19 The Game of the Gods, and BI 20 The Lie. Other important writings include Humanity is the Devil, the Gods and their People, as it is, the Gods on War, and the Unity of Christ and Satan. In the Game of the Gods, it is explained the role of the gods as they interact and are reflected in man. Satan's role is explained, as is the purpose of evil. If he didn't exist as a form of separation, the game wouldn't be bailed to be played. It is through this cycle that union and harmony is maintained. Humanity is the devil explains that man has faltered in blindness and deception and taken on the role of the adversary. It is an admonishment upon man given in a time of retribution so that man may be able to change his fate. As it is, is a pronouncement of mankind's impending calamity. Salvation may be found for those seeking to banish fear and ignorance and live in unity with one's God. It is written for those who desire to break the pattern of reality perpetrated as a lie, and to live life as it really is. Each issue of the Process magazine dealt with subjects with great emotional impact on death, on sex, on fear, on love, etc. The Grey Forces, which are often referred to in Process literature signify conformity, mediocrity, repression, weak will, resentment, futility, compromise, and the spirit of all that hinders progress and evolution. At its peak period in 1971, the process consisted of about 250 members. People were attracted and drawn into the fold through a number of means. Donating was a practice usually done by messengers and prophets. They were expected to donate and to bring money into the organization, and often functioned on minute amounts of sleep. They hit the streets with a stack of process magazines and other literature and had a goal of raising as much money as possible selling the process materials. Oftentimes, celebrities were encountered while donating and sometimes were enticed into appearing in photos and interviews that ran in the process magazines. Occasionally, they even were curious enough as to attend meetings to discover what the process were all about. The money collected was rigorously tallied and all statistics were kept track of by higher level members. In the coffee houses run by the process, they advertise classes and group encounter sessions where their psychotherapeutic techniques were demonstrated. In the telepathy developing to circle, a group of participants sat in a circle in a candlelit room facing one another and once they had chosen a subject of focus, they conducted a meditation in which they vividly imagined subjects that were focused upon in a sense mocking them up within a subtle level of psychical manifestation. After this process, they discussed and analyzed the images that had appeared. In some instances, prescient information would be gleaned of events that hadn't yet transpired, and sometimes a course was set in motion based upon these messages. One such message led to the group traveling to Stil. In the midnight meditation sessions, which were held every Friday and Saturday a ritual was conducted, led by a single priest serving as the sacrifice. Subjects were decided upon and suggested by the patrons that attended. This consisted of two opposing concepts. The focus was that a resolution of conflict is achievable by fully reflecting upon both sides of an issue or idea and recognizing the underlying connection that comes into play in a more occluded level. Interspersed between these meditations, processes were sung. Progresses were educational and therapeutic classes which were held for initiates, disciples or messengers. These superseded the communications course originally held by conclusions analysis. In addition to the study of Processian teaching, a series of exercises were practiced which pushed beyond the limits of sensitivity and interpersonal communication and broke through self-restricted levels of personal comfort in the participants. 
This study of intention counter intention served to accelerate the evolution of consciousness in the members. The P-scope or process E-meter was used in the early period of compulsions analysis but began to be phased out in the early period of the process. Photo identification cards were made for and distributed to all members. One revelation in Timothy Willey's book, Love Sex Fear Death, is that although Robert was the out front part of the Omega, Mary Ann was very much the one in charge, and had groomed Robert in his role of the teacher, and helped choose for him the message being transmitted, as well as the form in which it was presented. Robert was influenced and controlled by Mary Ann, and was the one following her plans the majority of the time. She was the one who had been gifted with the power to see into the deepest regions of one's personality as well as having incredible powers of persuasion and a dominant will that was able to manifest that which she set her mind to. It was generally known to those in higher ranks that although Robert wrote much of the doctrinal publications, Mary Ann was the one who wielded the power. Together Robert and Mary Ann formed the Omega. Robert served as the teacher, and Mary Ann is the oracle. In reading Robert's accounts and initial sketch for an autobiography, it is clear that Mary Ann was his muse and that he was fully willing to serve to her needs. He felt that she was an incarnation of a goddess. To quote from initial sketch, Mary Ann is a god figure for those who can't find God within themselves. And everyone needs God, either inside or outside, and very few can find it inside. She was after my soul. She wanted to drown my individuality in her own. She wanted to encompass me completely, starve my reality and replace it with her own. She'd done this with countless other people and she'd do it with countless more. I was just another candidate. There was an alternative she'd settle for. If she could drive me away. On my decision. That would also be a victory. Not so great a triumph as owning me but a triumph nonetheless. If I couldn't take what she handed out and still stay with the game, she'd have won by my default. But that was second best. The first and foremost goal was to have me believing everything she believed, and with as much conviction. As credit to the extent of her power of suggestion, I must admit that there were many times when she almost succeeded. It shouldn't have been hard to attribute to Mary Ann the infallibility of God. Basically, Mary Ann was the real drive in the situation, I was the intellect. She had the certainty, I had the answers. She had the eye for an opening, I had the means to navigate it. She knew the move to make, I knew how to make it. Without her, I'd have been too uncertain to plunge ahead. But between us we had the essential elements and in no time at all we were in business. Celebrities played a role in getting the message of the process transmitted and able to be received by a receptive audience. Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful were prominently visible on the cover of Process magazines and were also featured in interviews. George Clinton featured two of de Grimston's writings on his Funkadelic albums, America Eats Its Young contained a short piece entitled America, and Maggot Brain has an essay that had been taken from the Fear issue of the Process magazine. Many important and influential celebrities crossed paths with the Process and received their publications. Timothy Willey met Tim Leary and was able to give him heartfelt advice and a Processian perspective to help him deal with the weighty issues that he had been struggling with. He had previously met William Burroughs through Ian Somerville in Tangier in the 50s. A Process band was organized in Toronto and often played at the local Process coffee house. It came to be known as the Process version and featured Willey on lead guitar. They recorded 10 songs in a Toronto recording studio, but hopes were soon quashed by Mary Ann, who hadn't liked the music, so inevitably nothing further became of the recordings. Another foray into the media was attempted by Malachi, who had been invited to appear on a nationally syndicated talk show. He was told he was to receive a fair time allotment to explain his ideology, but instead, the opportunity was used to put him on the spot and devolved into a public scrutiny of the process. 
sex was used as a means of control within the group. Although celibacy was practiced by processes within the lower strata because it thwarted the natural flow of sexual energy, sex was viewed as a powerful force which one must come to terms with so as to not allow it to dominate one's behavior and thinking. The process experimented with sex couplings with members of the group. Some members were paired together in process unions and sexual relations were allowed with these members. However, no one owned each other in the process, and the concept of adultery didn't exist within the group. Group sex was indulged in at experimental gatherings that had been orchestrated by the Omega. But mostly was directed by Marianne. Members were encouraged to go beyond the bounds of societal restrictions and one's own inhibitions and to connect with their sexual energies at the core of their being. They acted out their deepest fantasies and subconscious desires. Normally, the Omega did not actively participate, although Mary Ann did couple herself with Willie in one instance. Sex seems to have played a factor in the dissolution of the marriage of Robert and Mary Ann. She seemed to encourage him to physically express his attraction to Mother Morgana, and afterwards to have used this against him in a manipulative power play that disposed him from his position in the Omega, and from his role of teacher within the process. Children that were born and brought up in the process community were cared for by nannies in the group whose chief duties were to attend to them. They sometimes were sustained in small quarters under somewhat harsh conditions and were treated with a harsh authority. The original mode of dress, or pea gear, was a long black cape with a cowl hood worn over all black attire. The badge of Mendes, which consisted of a black triangle with its point facing downward, and the sabbatic goat of Eliphaz Levi in the center, also adorned the uniform. This struck an intimidating image to those who first encountered a procession. After 1971 this uniform was changed to a more moderate gray leisure suit, designed to change the public perception of church members. Eventually it was determined that the grays were too bland, and may have been too similar to representing the gray forces, so they were changed once again to medium blue. The 4P cross, created by Mother Sybil, consisted of four lines which joined at 90 degree angles and formed a square in the middle. It had a similar look to that of a Nazi swastika. The 4Ps represented in the process symbology follow a fourfold tetragrammatical approach and are also reflective of the earth, air, fire, water division of nature as symbolized in ceremonial magic. The next 4P cross was designed by Robert and was more stylized in its conception and had a similar look to a German iron cross. It was the icon most prominently displayed with process material and the one that they became most recognized by. Another symbol designed by Robert was the conjoined Alpha and Omega symbol. It is referred to as the sign of union and has both mystical and sex magical overtones to it. The Unity Cross consists of a large silver cross with a coiled red serpent whose body is contained within the cross. It represented the coming together of Christ and Satan, and was a powerful symbol worn by many members. After Robert left the process, the P Cross was replaced with the six-pointed Star of David with two Fs. One upside down facing the other, which were conjoined. On March 23, 1974, a schism occurred which resulted in Robert being asked to step down from his position of leadership within the process. This order came from the Council of Masters. Several months after, Robert's writing in their entirety were dropped from the curriculum. Lawyers for the church advised that this would be best to avoid any claims that Robert may try to make concerning the process. Within a short time, the name of the group was changed to the Foundation Church of the Millennium. At this juncture it was decided to do away with the four God system, removing Lucifer and Satan, and de-emphasizing Christ. The restructuring adhered only to Jehovah. The negative press received from an association with Charles Manson, and the satanic bend of a portion of the church literature, were contributing factors in the establishment of the new order. Its motivation was to distance the process from its prior dark and atavistic nature as much as could be achieved.
At this critical point, leadership within the group took on a much more rigid, authoritative tone, which resulted in eroding membership within a short time. Robert attempted to continue along on his own. He turned to the New Orleans chapter, which he viewed as having the most potential, and attempted to set up a program to teach courses and start a process college, but was unable to stir enough interest in the project. He wrote the Matthew Commentaries, which was a commentary on the New Testament. He then traveled to Toronto, and then on to Boston, where he began working with a fledgling group which he began to refer to as the Waltham Group, but unfortunately there wasn't enough potential within the group and nothing got off the ground. By 1979, he had given up any further hope of continuing a process group under his leadership and withdrew any further contact with these past associations. After the series of futile attempts, Robert chose to return to the world of the Grey Forces, and took a series of mundane jobs. He tried to propose a legal settlement from the Foundation considering all that he had contributed since its inception, but was unable to work out any sort of deal. The Foundation Church took on a more acceptable public appearance and worked in the area of healing, and led a series of courses. They began psychic workshops, focus and forum, which replaced telepathy developing to circles and progresses. They eliminated the original axiom of the unity of Christ and Satan, stopped using the church emblems, and discontinued singing many of the hymns. In their new structure, which was more spirituality-based, they believed that a messiah was coming but hadn't yet arrived. Well, they realized after having revealed a life-changing meditational experience and then sharing this with Marianne and receiving little feedback or serious consideration, that she felt that to garner any attention towards this would be a threat to her position of authority. Marianne became more tyrannical and intolerant in her leadership after the schism had occurred. In 1975, the name was once again changed to the Foundation Faith of the Millennium. In 1976, a healing ministry was begun in New York. After a dispute with upper-level members, Willie and seven others chose to leave the group to begin an autonomous subchapter of the foundation known as the Unit. This was met with legal wrangling by members of the foundation and after less than a year, the Unit dissolved. After several less than profitable years had passed, Foundation members relocated to Cana, Utah, in 1984 and decided on another dramatic reinvention by eliminating all religious affiliations held by the group. The name Foundation Faith was dropped and changed to a non-profit business known as Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. Since its inception in the late 80s, it has continued to expand and thrive and is now one of the most successful sanctuaries in the country. It even has its own television show on National Geographic called Dogtown, which is recorded at Best Friends. Mary Ann died on November 14, 2005. Reportedly she had been in a coma prior to her death. A rumor mentioned by Willie is that during an evening stroll at Best Friends, she was attacked by a pack of wild dogs that ripped her throat out and tore her apart. A fitting mythology for a woman who styled herself as the goddess Hecate. She was married to longtime process master and best friends administrator Gabriel de Payer at the time of her death. The best book written about the process, from an academic perspective is Satan's Power by William Bainbridge, published in 1978. It gives a thorough account of the activities and philosophy of the group and follows their history up to the period of the Foundation Faith, and is presented from a sociological point of view. It was written with the assistance of Robert de Grimston, so it may have a slight bias towards his view of how events transpired. In this book, the names and orders were given pseudonyms to protect the confidentiality of those involved. Quite unfortunately, this book was never republished after its first printing and is scarce to come across but it still can be occasionally seen on the collectible book market. A chapter of Ed Sanders' subjective and highly speculative book on Manson, the family, drew unfounded connections between Manson and the process merely because one of the process headquarters was located in close proximity to where the Manson family were residing. 
some of Manson's notions of incarnating the energies of the Braxis and going beyond good and evil were similar to de Grimston's thesis of the reconciliation of opposites. The dissolution of the enmity between God and Satan. While this drew and wanted attention to the process, in subsequent printings of the book, this chapter was removed due to litigation by the process, who successfully sued the publisher E.P. Dutton, the connection had been made in the court of public opinion between Manson and the process. Members of the group even went so far as to visit Manson in prison and in a subsequent article in the death issue of the process magazine, a brief article contrasted Manson's writings on death with that of the Christian author Malcolm Muggeridge. While this may have been seen as taboo to associate with Manson and present his writing, it nonetheless presents a thought-provoking perspective, and its inclusion was quite bold and daring at the time. However, the mere inclusion and association with Manson drew the ire of those who had already viewed the process with trepidation and held fear of the unknown which they represented, and this provided easy fodder with which to draw a loose connection between the process and the nefarious activities of the Manson family. A guilt by association mentality. Manson espoused that he was both Jesus and the devil. This is similar to the process concept of the unity of Christ and Satan, or in other words, coming to terms and uniting both extremes of one's personality so that rather than being at odds with one's nature, they are able to achieve a unity in one's being. In Chapter 5 of the first edition of Sanders' The Family, he states that the process appeared in L.A. in early 1968 and retained a prominent presence until several days before the shooting of Robert Kennedy in June. 1968, at which time they dropped out of sight. He quotes de Grimston from Jehovah on War, Release the fiend that lies dormant within you, for he is strong and ruthless and his power is far beyond the bounds of human frailty. By this, he implies that Robert is advocating the acceleration of bloodshed and violence and that once this has transpired, the process would be the chosen ones who shall lead the way in the post-Armageddon. Maury Terry was a part of the satanic ritual abuse hysteria which was in full force in 1987. Sanders purports that the process magazines eulogized Hitler and that its graphic content spilled forth with gore and mayhem. He includes sections from an interview with brother Eli also known as Victor Wilde, who had been recruited into the process in LA. Eli explains that as the process swept through different parts of the world, they attracted converts, and that by a multi-god approach, the appeal broadened, as certain individuals gravitated toward a particular god. Either Jehovah, Lucifer or Satan, depending upon their predisposition. The Satanists are depicted as the goons with a streak towards violence. Sanders attempts to link the process to a network of death cults operating in California, and through this to suggest that Charles Manson was involved in this. In a jailhouse interview, when asked whether Manson was familiar with Robert de Grimston, he remarked, you're looking at him. Although both process members and Manson were known to have hung out at the spiral staircase in Topeka Canyon in Malibu and that both had resided on Call Street, it was at different periods of time, and their paths never directly crossed. Sanders further speculates that the process may have even been an influence on Robert Kennedy murderer Sirhan Sirhan. While some of the historical accounts in Sanders' research seem to be accurate and to have been gleaned from process magazines, the conclusions drawn from his research seem to have been gathered from his mistaken beliefs, from reading the Grimson's apocalyptical writings and taking them far too literally. It was quite fortunate that this chapter was removed after the first printing due to the erroneous information it contained after legal action was taken by the process. Just as in Sanders' book, there is also a chapter in The Ultimate Evil by Maury Terry entitled The Process. Bear in mind that in the year in which this book first appeared, 1987, there was a new scare in the media that focused upon satanic ritual abuse and was also known as the Satanic Panic Epidemic. This book is one that set the foundation for the hysteria being perpetrated and was off-sided when referencing unconfirmed accounts of satanic activity.
The insidious factor that set the precedent in this book was the theory that there exists a covert, highly orchestrated satanic organization which trafficked in murder, child pornography, drugs, human and animal sacrifice and that it threatened the very fiber of modern society. In Untermeyer Park located in Yonkers, skinned German shepherds were discovered. David Berkowitz was known to have been in the area shortly before they had been discovered. The process was known to be fun of the Alsatian breed of German Shepherd. Terry implies that perhaps the sacrifices could have been initiated by a fringe group within the process. In Berkowitz's letter to Breslin, he refers to a group that took credit for the murderous mayhem, known as the 22 Disciples of Hell. Terry perceived the process to be a cult, so in researching the group, he already imagined all sorts of sinister abominations lurking behind every corner. Terry spoke to Sanders while researching this book, so it should be kept in mind that much of the information provided regarding the process came through the filter of Ed Sanders, who was an advisor for this book. It presents his slanted, biased view that the process was a sinister satanic cult. Terry saw them strictly as a satanic group, rather than a fourfold equilateral system that was focused upon a union of opposites. Once again, as with Sanders, Terry took literally the writings of de Grimston as easy fodder to present his view that the process was a cult bent on hastening the end of the world through means of chaos and murder in order to cleanse the world of the grey forces so that they could rebuild a satanic empire in the new world order. Another de Grimston quote that Terry seized upon was the statement, My prophecy upon this wasted earth and upon the corrupt creation that squats upon its ruined surface is thou shall kill. This was taken from Jehovah on war. It should be remembered that in this tumultuous period the Vietnam War raged on daily and student protests sought a way out of the senseless slaughter being perpetrated in the name of freedom. Terry asserts that Manson had been heavily influenced by the process and that he shared an affinity to the idea of a duality of Jesus Satan which he believed he was a living example of. Similarities between the process writings on fear and Manson's concept of getting the fear, is viewed as more than mere coincidence by Terry. The process magazine's fear, and death, he viewed as being chock full of Nazi and other forms of forbidden imagery. The union of the Lamb of God and the Goat of Satan were described by Terry as an unholy alliance. He reveals that all members of the process, regardless of their affiliation with a particular god, were required to undergo a long stretch of Satan worship, supposedly involving blood rituals and sacrifice. He states that Stanley Baker admitted that he was a member of a process offshoot in Santa Cruz known as 4P, or the 4P movement. Baker stated that the group practiced ritual human sacrifice and that he was a cannibal and had ritually sacrificed dogs as well. One murder that he had been convicted of, occurred in O'Neill Park in the Santa Ana Mountains. The group of which Stanley was a member, was said to possess a portable crematorium to dispose of any evidence of their crimes. Terry goes on to speculate that Berknowitz was simply a hitman for the four pie. In the updated epilogue to the 1999 edition of The Ultimate Evil, Berkowitz admits that he was a member of four pie and that he had witnessed German shepherds being sacrificed. The occult superstar hitman Manson too has his identity revealed to be Bill Menzer, and it is stated that he quite possibly could have been the Grand Chingon, the title for the head of 4 Pi. He had been convicted of the murder of producer Roy Radden, and may have been involved in several of the Son of Sam killings as well. Manson family members even suggested that Manson may have been the Grand Chingon, in an interview which was broadcast on AE Investigative Reports, Berkowitz now asserted his knowledge of the 4P movement being involved in the drug trade and with underage sex soirees which catered to a wealthy clientele who craved depravity. He purported that they also were involved in producing snuff films. It is stated that Manson also recently revealed in a jailhouse interview to have met the heads of the process in the spiral staircase. In the end of the book Terry gives a dire revelation that the process or 4P movement as I believe he is referring to, 
is still out there and remains active, but is operating in an underground capacity, concealed behind socially acceptable fronts. Hard to believe that throughout this pack of loose speculation and innuendo, the 4 pie, which Terry would have readers believe, is operating as a malignant evil underlying the very fabric of society and hell-bent on murder and ushering in the Armageddon. However, it is interesting that since the process first appeared, no member has ever been accused of any crime, nor has Terry's thesis in yellow journalism proved anything to the contrary. According to Peter Lavenda, members of the process were often seen in Herman Slater's Magical Child store in Manhattan. Allegations have suggested that initially the process was a front for a German neo-fascist group founded by the German Democratic Party, and that Mary Ann believed herself to have been the reincarnation of Joseph Goebbels. It was known that she had studied Hitler's ascension to power. Although the process incorporated Satan into the echelon of gods in the late 60s, the Processian Satan symbolism differed greatly from the one depicted in the Church of Satan. Some suggest that the Four Pi group was a continuation of a group that splintered off from the satanic branch of the process. Which rather than disbanding with Mary Ann's strictly Jehovian process after 1974, merely remained and continued to operate underground. In Helter Skelter, by Bogliosi, some speculation was raised that Bruce Davis, a Manson family member, visited the process headquarters in 1968, as well as the London Scientology headquarters, but this has never been substantiated. UFO author Whitney Stryber stated that he had also visited the process headquarters in London in 1968, prior to his alien encounters. In Sinister Forces, Lavenda teeters between just suggesting the possibility of Manson having direct dealings with the process, and in other places definitively asserting that they had been in contact with one another. In the early 90s, a collective was began by Genesis P. Orge, Nivik Ogre, and William Morrison, who had all shared a deep and abiding appreciation of an interest in the process Church of the Final Judgment. It was an open-ended collective as espoused the ideas and theories of the process. A new order was initiated by Genesis simultaneous to this which was known as the Outer Process International or TOPI, not to be confused with the Temple of Psychic Youth or TOPY. The collective were involved with a website is process.org, which offered discourse and dialogue regarding the process. It encourages involvement with writers and artists who wish to share processian inspired materials. An online writing attributed to Father Malachi, but very much couched in the P. Orge writing style, is called The Process Is and provides an excellent explanation of the process philosophy and how the process techniques can be utilized to regain control in one's life and provide the liberation needed to achieve one's desires. It fully explains the goals and aims of chatprocess.org is serving to achieve greater understanding of the methods of the process and a deeper awareness and purpose in divining one's true will. In 1996, Skinny Puppy released an album entitled The Process. It is a concept album based on the process Church of the Final Judgment. On the Psychic TV CD Force The Hand of Chance is a hidden track not mentioned on the track listing which is a short, mind-warping barrage that includes a series of questions similar to ones that may be given to one hooked up to the peace scope, followed by an unsettling pronouncement Welcome to the Process. Music video producer William Morrison of Process Media Labs in assistance with Genesis P. Orge, released a video called The Process is the Product and in addition, Morrison made two music videos for Skinny Puppies The Process for the song's hard set head, and Candle which used elements from the collaborative video. Both are replete with Process Church imagery taken from that initial video collaboration. In 1988, a site sprang up known as the Society of Processines, which appears to be purely an online endeavor that provided information and links to process publications and other materials. They offered to raise awareness into areas of interest to modern-day processines and for those desirous to see things through a processian perspective. It appears to have some connection with process.org. 
an advertisement for Love, Sex, Fear, Death by Timothy Willie published by Feral House, was directed by Morrison and is listed on YouTube and includes the secret audio track by Psychic TV Welcome to the Process. A band called Electric Wizard has a process-inspired video on YouTube called The Process Ian. Timothy Willie has a brief interview on YouTube and answers several questions regarding the process. A website called the Neo Church of Final Judgment at 4p2.org was an experiment by Joseph Matheny of Ong's Hat Infamy. An online interview with Matheny is entitled Fear and Loathing on the Internet Reddix Part 1. The interview is conducted by Nick Pell of Black Sun Gazette and is taken from a podcast from February 23, 2009, on G-Spot. Matheny admits to having been the person who created the 4P2 project as a social exercise in myth-making and data collection. He viewed the process as it was seen publicly as being a boogeyman that had a dark, enduring myth that had been exploited and misrepresented through the writings of Ed Sanders and Maury Terry. The fictitious shadowy group responsible in these books was known as the 4P movement or 4Pi. This was the identity that Matheny chose for his charade because of its ominous and nefarious associations. It was an experiment to see what sorts of response would be received from the conspiracy sites by purporting that the 4Pi movement was reforming. It was purposely disinformational in its conception and done as an exercise in critical thinking. He simply linked the 4P2 site to the Process Church Wikipedia page to create exposure for the site. In the page, he included pictures of Berkowitz, Manson, Zodiac, and the smiley face killer to add to the foreboding mystique. The site was organic in its creation in the sense that once Matheny set it up, he left it alone to see what sort of effect it would cause. The site received a lot of traffic and during its peak period, it received over 13,000 visits. The majority of responses came from conspiracy theorists and true crime buffs. Particularly those interested in Zodiac, son of Sam, Manson came to the site. Half of the people that wrote to Matheny sent vitriolic, hostile letters accusing him of horrendous, irresponsible actions. The other half were described by Matheny as disturbed, sociopathic individuals looking to join and or associate themselves with 4Pi and anxious to be mentored in mayhem. Matheny is a cultural engineer who posits diverse avenues of endeavor such as writing, producing and invention focused on fringe belief systems. He went so far as to identify himself as Manson too the fictional maniacal leader of the 4Pi group who supposedly trained Manson and Berkowitz. Matheny first became acquainted with the process while hanging out on the same circles as Psychic TV and Skinny Puppy just as their CD The Process was being released. At this period there was a great upsurge of interest in the ideas and philosophy of the process. At this point Genesis wanted to usher in a rebirth of the process and was making inroads in this direction. Matheny was more interested in the methodologies and techniques used in the process rather than any doctrine associated with it. As Matheny had theorized only about 2% of his responses to his site got what he was doing. Matheny's inherent approach is to question reality, authority and belief systems which are blindly adhered to by the vast majority of the population. He views most magical groups as originally having useful techniques designed to break a person out of consensus reality, but once they become institutionalized they devolve into lifeless rituals devoid of their initial power. After the publication of Love, Sex, Fear, Death, The Inside Story of the Process Church of the Final Judgment by Timothy Willey and published by Adam Parfrey and Farrell House in 2009 a renewed interest in the process was kindling on August 23rd a Sabbath assembly was conducted in Los Angeles. This was followed by the publication of Propaganda and the Holy Writ of the Process Church of the Final Judgment which is a lavish hardcover reproduction of three issues of the Process magazine. Sex, Fear and Death In 2011 by Feral House For those who were able to be a part of the process, it represented an initiatory school that allowed for the possibility of spiritual advancement and evolutionary growth to occur. 
it was a revolutionary system that changed the lives of those involved with it. While some members in the end may have felt themselves to have been financially exploited by the Omega, it gave members a chance to experience life in a spiritual, philosophical mystery school in an environment that couldn't be encountered anywhere else.